ladies and gentlemen, Alistair Kathness is a friend of mine from years back when we met at an autism charity celebrity poker tournament in LA. And uh, we've just been friends ever since. Really cool to see him get into the blockchain space. And as I was making fun of you before we brought you on, Alistair, you have like a, a, is it fair to call it a freakishly Scottish name? Yeah, I just, I'll just take my mask off for you just now, Adam. Look at this. You get the matching boxer shorts with it. <laughs> uh, well, uh, here. <laughs> Look at right. that, everybody. Look at this is the matching ones for a bit of home entertainment. Uh, get there. Get there. <laughs> all right. So, so Alistair, well, you live in California now. Yeah, I live in San Diego. San Diego, originally from Scotland. Um, I, I mean, by by, is there anything people need to know about your name? Uh, yeah, you know, Alistair Caithness. So it's Alistair Campbell Caithness, and the Caithness is a northern part of Scotland. So in the very north of Scotland, it's called Caithness, and that's where my surname or second name comes from. And how long have you been in the United States? I've been here just over five years now. But my um, wife is from San Diego, so I've been coming to San Diego since 2003, basically. Yeah, and you haven't been able to uh, afford a speech therapist the whole time. That's really sad. But you know, eventually, <laughs> eventually that, it, it'll fade. It'll fade. You'll learn how to speak Californian, and, and we'll be able to understand you a little bit better. Now, all right, so but as to your personal story, your background, if, if you would please maybe, I think, start with, you know, at, at least how you went from what you were doing in Scotland to doing Bitcoin in America. So, so basically what we're doing is, so my company's called Zion Energy. So we are an energy company. So what we've created is Zion Coin, which is essentially, it's, a, I wouldn't say it's a cryptocurrency, it's a security token, and it's backed against energy assets. So what our company's doing is we're tokenizing the financial structures of energy assets and allowing people to invest, a sort of democratization of ownership into energy assets. And the way we've got it structured is initially we're looking at the oil and gas market and providing this level of liquidity for uh, oil and gas. But uh, we're, we've branched out and we're looking to tokenize renewable energy assets going forward. Uh, so what that will do is it'll allow your man in the street the first time ever to essentially invest into renewable energy. Because right now you can't actually invest in renewable energy unless uh, you're a pension fund or you're somebody putting in like say 50 million dollars to acquire part of a wind farm and a solar farm but under our system what we're doing is we'll tokenize the asset sort of fractionalize it and allow people to invest in uh, an asset an energy asset which essentially is going to give them distributions and these distributions will be paid in fiat currency or cryptocurrency and allow them to essentially own an asset that generates it electricity or with oil or energy or nuclear power and it doesn't matter which energy producing asset it yeah, is right, right. well Alistair, this is this is just for me as a you know a, a you know an economics nerd as a, a bitcoin fan a, as a libertarian this is this is all very exciting because to me this is a, a critical economic development that is going to radically you know really revolutionize energy uh, resource management it's going to allow for a lot of different economic uh, opportunities that didn't exist before. It's going to create a lot more inefficiency. It's going to take away a lot of the profiteering through inefficiency in the current economic system, especially around energy. But what you're doing is, is going to one of the, the industries that's most ripe for this before it even goes to, to, to all of its other applications, starting with oil and gas. But before we get into that, the, the bigger picture implications there, can you break it down for people who just don't even know what a blockchain is? Because I get it and instinctively go, okay, yes, you have a blockchain, which is a decentralized ledger tokenization. You can create a token that is, that, that is a, a representation of and, and a way to trade energy assets. But what, is, what does all that mean? Even? Just so I, I just think for, for people out there, they, you know, they've heard of shares before. So you own share in a company. It's a bit like fractional ownership. So it's a bit like these are these massive energy producing assets. And up until now, the technology essentially didn't exist to allow you to have very small fractional ownership. So only big corporations and governments own these energy producing assets. But because of the blockchain and democratization of ownership and fractionalization, 
essentially people are going to be able to own small pieces of these energy producing assets. So and going forward, what it'll do is there'll be so many implications of it, the, the way things will change. But I think if people think about fractionalization as an easy way for people to understand this and really the technology of the blockchain and the technology of what Bitcoin's brought to the blockchain is really allowing people to have this fractional ownership. And, you know, for your man in the street, if you said to them 10 years ago, you know, you could invest five hundred dollars and have ownership of a wind farm that every six months is going to give you a, a distribution of this, you know, that would be impossible. So really what this is doing is it's essentially allowing fractional ownership and this ability to have ownership and assets. So this, that's where the word democratization comes in, because what we're doing is taking massive physical assets. It's called tokenization is the place I'm involved in. So we're tokenizing assets. So in 10 years from now, believe it or not, the whole world's going to be tokenized, you know, so it's like all assets will be tokenized. And everyone will own this tokenization through digital wallets and the digital wallets will be wallets in your iPhone. And in the same way, if you said to people 10 years ago, you know, what's a digital wallet? Would you have something like that? And the answer is no one would really know what it is. But now like an Apple wallet's a digital wallet. So you can go in a Starbucks, like you said to someone 10 years ago, oh, by the way, there's going to be this coffee shop that's going to be all over the world and you're not going to have to pay in cash and you're going to have an app on a phone that you're going to basically choose your coffee, come in, scan it, and uh, your coffee will be uh, sitting there. You'll just scan your phone, take your coffee and leave, you know. That, that's 10 years ago, people couldn't even believe that sort of technology would exist. And now we do it every single day. So right, sorry, it's so I want to get, I want to get that, that, that's a great transition to my next question because I, I want to get a sense of the, the timeline on all of this. And, and, and the comparison used was great because we had this Bitcoin wallet technology, but it still wasn't easy and reliable in a way that people could understand the security of it. it still had this risk of well shit if i forget my passcode or i don't have my 12 words written down if i or if i lose the, my phone i lose the money i didn't i got it like just it wasn't as established of a system even as the the modern and we want to say well it's better than the banking system we have a currency that goes up in value they have a currency that loses value with fiat and inflation well yes but they provide a whole other set of security services that go along with the U.S. dollar and banks that make it impractical for most people to even say, I'm going to have a personal crypto wallet and use it with confidence, right? I mean, you have to have a certain initiative and confidence to, to be able to just get into that. Now, not just that, but then the bigger picture with the, the tokenization of commodities we see this happening, you know, how much how much value is tokenized at this point compared to how much will be, including, you know, all crypto. It seems like we're very early on in this space. And, uh, you know, and then the last part of my question would be where we have this sort of hurdle with Bitcoin as currency for mainstream adoption of the, you know, the killer app, the ultimate system, the lightning network, whatever it is. You know, what is it that we need to get to the next level? of adoption with tokenization at an industrial energy level scale like you're working on? Yeah, so, so if you think of the, the global um, worth of the energy industries, maybe like $17 trillion. So you're thinking of that that's going in. So so essentially, if Bitcoin got out to, it's always difficult to do valuations of Bitcoin because I think what most people don't realize, and this is what cryptocurrency can do, is it does two things at the same time. So essentially, Bitcoin, when he first, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto uh, developed it, it was a transaction from A to B anywhere in the world instantaneously, uh, avoiding all banking charges and avoiding any sort of time delay, government involvement, and this a way to send money. But then there was a finite amount of Bitcoin, and then it also became like a commodity. So Bitcoin's also a commodity, but it's also a transaction, and it's also a technology. And most people can't realize that this thing does all three things, you know. So that's what's is so impressive about what Bitcoin's doing, you know. But really, 
as the world can, you think, with security tokens, it's just like they're operating on blockchains now. And all the big companies are like, if you look at the big blockchains that are getting developed, it's like IBM, it's Amazon, it's Microsoft. It's all the big software companies are developing the blockchains, even the last two years. And since we first tokenized our first asset and did this, we were using sort of customized blockchains. I know it all runs on Ethereum, but when you tokenize things. But now if you're looking to run data on blockchains, you know, Amazon Web Server, they've got their own blockchain that you can use now. So it's so if people think it's not going to come in, it's going to come in in the next three to five years huge because now the massive software companies are essentially running it. You know, 70% of the world's shipping is run on a blockchain uh, operated by IBM. So how long until so we it's see, it's already I think it's happening on this. So how how long until we see the majority of oil and gas being traded on a blockchain? I, I would say in the next like five to ten years. And what you are know? the impacts ten years? Or, I think ten years the whole thing will be on the blockchain. You know, and, it'll and just be it'll just be it's 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 a bit like adoption of uh, music when we went to digital music. So essentially, you know, we wanted more music than a CD player could provide you. And a CD player could uh, provide you more than a tape deck, you know. Then, then, and then we went to uh, this sort of uh, iPod and now your iPhone, now it's unlimited music, you know. So it's okay. a bit like that transition that's happened with tokenization. It's probably halfway through. It's probably at the iPod level. So it's not going to iPhone cloud. We can access all music like the Apple Store. It's about halfway there. And if you think this all came around in 2016, they started speaking about it. 2018, they expected mass adoption. It's 220. The people involved in running a lot of the tokenization, right? In 220, you know, 2025, everything will be starting to move that way so fast, you know. So for the average consumer who just who doesn't care about any of this. It's just get get me my my electricity and my water and my internet and everything as, as cheap as possible. Is is there is it going to change anything or is it just it, it makes things way more efficient and everything gets delivered cheaper? Yeah, so so if the government involvement's not involved in selling us electricity, essentially electricity is going to go down in price, you know? To the point that we, you know, as we move to see the problem with like, if you think about the Green New Deal and everybody moving into the renewable energy industry, the thing about it is it's going to be, it's not going to be as labor intensive as oil and gas. That's why long term renewable energy is cheaper than oil and gas. Now we need to produce massive amounts to replace it, but essentially it's not going to have this big labor intensive push once we've actually constructed everything. Because you don't need people to basically run a solar panel, you know, in 10 years from now. So when that actually happens, unless there's government taxation in, on there, what's going to happen is the cost of electricity is going to start to rapidly de de decrease. So therefore, the world is going to change because essentially we could move to a model in 10 years from now where essentially electricity is close to being free. Now, if electricity is close to being free, then suddenly it's like, wait a minute, if electricity is free, then suddenly we can stop with all the shipping industry and everything getting stuff manufactured in one place to bring it back because we've got the electricity to go this way. So really, as we move forward with this, because I think most people don't realize, they think oil and gas is subsidized. And yes, the drilling aspect is subsidized, but the government heavily taxes oil and gas or your gasoline at a federal level and also a state level. You know, that's why gas is different prices in California to Texas because of the state level. So they, they're going to have to find revenue from something else. So their overall plan, I think, going forward is they're either going to have to tax renewable energy. But if they don't tax renewable energy, suddenly we're going to move into a world whereby electricity is going to be free. And if we yes. move in a world where electricity is going to yeah. be free, it's going to change everything. Because why are you invading someone to steal their nat uh, natural resources when you've got the electricity anyway? like the Iraq war, you know, big oil, you know, the benefits of all these things can come in. You can do that. But if you look at all these things, you know, what's the point in invading someone if you've got 100% electricity? There's not, you know? Yes. And that's what people don't think about. They don't think about the implications. Oh, this guy's saying something. It sounds like a little bit of a technology change, it, but it's the ripple effect in the pond. Suddenly, if you had free electricity everywhere, and then most people in renewable energy, but I'm going to make the money from 
developing the product. Yeah, there's cost to develop the wind turbines and there's cost to develop the solar panels. But the whole point of renewable energy and why it's cheaper is it doesn't have the labor intensive costs as traditional fossil fuels. So essentially, if we create an environment whereby suddenly your house is free electricity. So if your house becomes free electricity and you can create surplus electricity, you can grow your own food. You know, so suddenly, yeah, I'm just going to, and I can have this thing run in 24 hours because it's not doing anything bad to the environment because I'm basically using renewable energy to get it. And that's yes. the cycle that is yes. basically we're involved in doing, you know, and I think as people start to understand it, because people don't really understand CO2 emissions. They don't understand that so much of the CO2 emissions in the world has involved us shipping things from one part of the world to the other. So essentially, if you wanted to get a T-shirt manufactured, you want to be manufactured as close as possible. You don't want that T-shirt manufactured in a sweatshop in Vietnam and then right. gone multiple shipping all the way here. Because what's actually happening on the blockchain now is they reckon in the next five years, they'll be able to work out the CO2 emissions in every product you get. And the same way they have calorie counts for stuff. Now, right now, if you want to buy a pair of Nike trainers, do you think that's been manufactured in a sweatshop in China or Vietnam? I shouldn't ban that morally. No, I want the new Air Jordans. I'm going to pay 200 bucks for it. I don't care. But if suddenly the CO2 emissions was on the box, suddenly the CO2 emissions is so much less for manufactured product in Mexico than it is there. Oh, well, by the way, I, want, I want to stop you on that one point, Alistair, because I'm not, I, I, it's not that the consumer shaming on carbon emissions is the mechanism of getting smarter manufacturing and distribution choices for the market as a whole being more efficient. It's that it's factored into the cost properly and governments are no longer able to hide that cost. They are no longer able to distort the market. They are no longer able to hold us back from our potential as a species with the technology that we already have for energy production. And what you want to take away from this interview is that blockchain has the potential to liberate the energy industry from government intervention and the inefficiency of the dollar system and everything that else that is being used to choke us back from realizing this full potential. And all you look at where we are already with energy. And you know, as a homesteader, this show is powered by solar. Right now, I have my own off-grid solar setup. I can run my laptop. I can run my phone. I can, you know, just limited electronics. I can run a fridge. You know, things like I can run my power tools, water pumps, et cetera, et cetera. But we, we take these, th this fundamental limitation that we live with today for granted with energy and electricity. When you think back just 50 years even, just 100 years. But, you know, to go, go back 100 years when these technologies didn't exist, right, when the internal combustion engine and, and modern electricity weren't even a thing before, you know, the ACDC wars and all, uh, you know, Nikola Tesla versus Edison, all of that. Before any of that, how primitive human life was compared to today, and it's because of energy. It's because of how we're able to make electricity and run internal combustion engines. And because that has been the dominant form of fueling human society, governments have stepped in and really screwed it up bad right yeah. and now you look at africa all these places as well it's just like yes. their biggest problem right now is their get their lack of energy even though we're actually there taking their energy sources in terms and of so coal cool. oil cobalt mining everything but they but get Alistair, enough electricity for that but they don't get enough electricity to actually live and what alistair is talking about uh, of just applying a, a tokenization system that allows us to uh, just move resources more efficiently and within so much existing framework that is already screwed up is gonna help us move past that framework by directing energy resources more efficiently and getting the price down. And even now, even now, just getting the price down to the point where it's, I mean, already for a lot of people in first world countries, electricity is marginally free. They don't have to think about it in their homes. Turn on lights, run electronics, but when you're a homesteader and you realize the limits, it's running a 3D printer, running, being able to pull air out of the sky. There are so many things that you can do that we don't even appreciate. Like you said, Alistair, growing food. You had an automated system that did everything that was, you know, super hydroponic, whatever vegetables. You drop off a box in your backyard. You can feed your family with it because you've got the access, access to abundant electricity. I mean, just these are the things 
that we have the technology for. Why can't we have nice things? Because government. But what Alistair is talking about with the potential for blockchain and Zion coin in particular really is about getting to, to us to that state of uh, almost, I don't want to say free energy. I don't know if that's the right term, but you know, to have electricity at a cost that's so low. I think it wouldn't be free for big industrial companies, but right. for your man in the street, yes. they think that it should be, we should be looking to get a society where, especially like somewhere like America is that nobody poor should have their electricity bill holding them back, you know, and people back in the UK, it's like, People still freeze in winter and old people die in, in winter because they can't afford their electricity bills to keep them warm. And it's like that sort of thing. like it's like these people should that should even be a case. You know what I mean? Otherwise, old people don't want to put their electricity on because the bill's so frightening for what they'll get in. But they should keep it on 24 seven in cold places. And it's like things like that. That problem should just be solved anyway. And I think what the blockchain will do is it'll end up in the next 10 years that will change you know it'll just be people are just coming yeah. into this point in society whereby you know we want to look after the, the most vulnerable people in society and providing them free electricity is something we can already do and if they got free electricity that means they would actually have essentially free heating as well yes know? yes and i would say nobody should be held back for you know poverty and it's like yeah you know i'm, I'm still you know i believe in capitalism self-ownership and the free market and free trade and one of the reasons I believe in it is because it has the power to lift everyone up. And when you say nobody who's poor should be held back, what, what I go, nobody should be held back from realizing the full capacity of their intellect and, and the technology that's been invented right now. Seeing government limit who has access to technology and resources is robbing individuals of their right, their birthright to the human heritage of technology and applying that. Now, Alistair, we've only got a couple of minutes left here. And I have to put, we're, we're going to go on a, on a totally different tangent for the last part of this because I have to I have to point out that you are also the crypto advisor for the Kokesh for President campaign and are continuing to work with us going into 2024 in applying blockchain to the potential tokenization of the assets of the federal government for localization. Now, I don't want to get into that in particular because it's going to sound too much like a plug, but a lot of fun stuff. We're going to have Alistair on again to get into this as well when it becomes more relevant. But one of the other projects you're working on is with the Cal Exit movement. So you've got, you, you, since, since, the, since coming to the United States and getting involved in politics and seeing this uh, potential for blockchain, you've gone in a few other directions. Please tell us about those briefly, Alistair. So really what the AmeriCoin and we were working with Adam is that we, we can actually put under the, so the constitution when it was originally set up, you know, it, the land didn't belong to the government. It didn't belong to the king, which was King George, it belonged to the people. But under the same technology of tokenization and fractionalization, we can now tokenize the federal assets of the government and provide distributions to everybody. So that has a massive impact considering, you know, a third of the land in America belongs to the federal government. But it's not just about providing distributions. You're actually taking the biggest asset in America and you're democratizing ownership to the people. And this is why I was involved in with uh, Adam with AmeriCoin. Then I got involved with Marcus and Kalexic being their cryptocurrency advisor. So really involved in doing that as um, they have a push to try and get uh, California as his own republic. Obviously, they're uh, pushing the initiative. They have to get 600,000 signatures. Uh, it'll all depend on whether Trump wins or not. You know, the 5th of November, I think we'll get 600,000 if he's back in. But basically, what that's going to allow them to do is, and what Marcus, who's the president of CalExit, wants me to develop a cryptocurrency, which is essentially providing a level of sort of UBI, universal basic income. But it's it's not UBI. It's called tokenized asset distributions. So what people don't, but if I keep saying tokenized asset distributions, no one knows what I'm talking no, about. Hold on about. About the UBI term, I, I think it's it's it's. It's an interesting dichotomy because people should expect as their human heritage birthright a certain share to what everything has come before and not let, you know, allow, allow government to take that from us. But the UBI it's is like instead of electricity. You know, it's like free education. It's like the education you were talking about earlier in the show. It's like, 
you know, we're ch your child gets eighteen thousand dollars worth of education a year. That's how much they apportion to it. But if they give you the eighteen thousand dollars, you would actually. And if you said parents are home, well, wait a minute, we're all stuck at home. We'll just send you all the eighteen thousand dollars each. I've got four kids. Great, I'll become a teacher. You know, they're <laughs> totally there. everything's going online. Everything's becoming digital, and it's the same with the healthcare. It's like ninety-three percent of doctors' visits are done just like we're speaking right now. It's yeah. not very few people are actually going to the hospital at all anymore. So it's like, so this American quandary of like, we can't afford, it's it's about people living in poverty. We can provide them free electricity. We can provide them some level of free education. We can provide them a level of free healthcare. And, it's, and we can provide them through tokenized asset distributions, whereby for the first time, the poorest people in America would actually own an asset. And this asset is the biggest asset of them all. Now, if California did it, and this is what they're pushing for Calexa, you know, essentially that there's people written about this stuff. That, you know, the Yang Gang spoke about this. The problem was he never actually explained how he's going to pay for it. It's worse than that. When it's a government-based UBI, instead of saying, give me my birthright back, you're saying, put me on an allowance. Yeah, and that's exactly it. It's an allowance. So, but if we own this asset, which is the biggest asset in America, you know, you'd want the corporations to do well because the better the corporations do, the bigger your distribution gets. And the corporations become, and it's, then it's their job to basically fund everything. And this big asset that all the people would get, and you, you worked out before, you would, anyone at a social security, we can set the wallets up and you can actually have these distributions within five days. That's how long the technology takes people for this to happen. The only problem is the government needs to put the money in there for doing this. But people think, is that the same as UBI? It's not. It's not UBI because, as you say, UBI is an allowance. This is a massive asset. This is your, and you actually have a small ownership of it. And every quarter, six monthly, whatever the, the way you want to do it, you would get distributions of it. And then it would cover basic level of service, which essentially yeah. we should push for free anyway. You know? this, is, this, is, this is beautiful, Alistair. I'm sorry we got to go. But, you know, one of the things yeah. I wanted to talk about was, like, where's the enthusiasm? in crypto now and you gave it back to me man this is probably the most fun crypto interview I i've had talking about how blockchain is really going to revolutionize all of mm. these things thank thank you for restoring no, no problem. my enthusiasm for crypto right now mm -hmm. uh, we got to go uh, but alistair any, any just quick uh you know how can people connect with you yeah, well, I'm on uh, LinkedIn and Twitter. We've started a Twitter there as well. And then, you know, Calexic, Mar Marcus is on Calexic as well. So, you know, we're just on social media like everybody else. Zion.com is the name of the website. All right. Beautiful. Okay. Z -I -Z -I -Y -E -N. We'll get that in the notes. Thank you so much, Alex. Yeah.